Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. This is a special video daily editorial as I am getting an update from Skeena Resources, traded on the TSX and the NYSE under the same symbol, SKE. I am chatting with Paul Geddes, the company's Vice President of Exploration and Resource Development. Now, Paul has put together a handful of slides here to walk us through a bit of a review of the 2022 exploration program and some of the key news, which includes a feasibility study and a couple new areas, new discoveries that were actually made on the SK Creek property in the Golden Triangle of BC. And then we're also going to look ahead to this year in terms of the overall strategy at SK Creek, as well as the drilling that will occur. Now, Paul, thank you for putting together these slides. I'll interject some questions as you walk through, but please take us through this exploration review from last year and the outlook for this year. Thanks so much, Corey. I really appreciate you having me here. Um, yeah, I, I guess at the end of the day, what we really wanted to do at Skino was just remind the audience and uh, your listeners and you know existing shareholders, give them an update as to you know, what we accomplished in, in 2022, as well as what we're going to build on for 2023 as our encore. So, you know, if we go back to 2022, it was a pretty amazing year for us because we put out the feasibility study, which was the culmination of God only knows how much work that we uh, we put together since we optioned the property in 2017. And obviously, you know, it's very robust economics, and that's great. But the thing that I want everybody to remember is that we were so focused on converting those existing resources, which were the inferred category, to the measured and the indicated, you know, within the pits so that we could translate those into reserves once we applied the economic studies that we really didn't spread our wings too much with exploration. Now, it's one of these situations, you know, do you, do you keep committing to further growth and development and making the resource bigger, then you pull the trigger on the engineering? Or do you just say, okay, it's, it's good enough right now, we know that there's more and let's make it bigger. So that's what we elected to do is fast track the, the infill drilling, get this to the reserve category, and then, you know, with the nine year mine life that we're currently facing, you know, we know that we've got plenty more mineralization in the surrounding areas that we can grow organically and increase that mine life. And that's that's basically exploration's mandate for not only 2022, but also the years coming. So, again, if we just take a look at the, the deposit itself, you know, in a, in a regional long section looking towards the east, very simple cross section here. You can see the resource pit, uh, which is you know quite similar to what the reserve pit looks like. You know there are some underground uh, targets here as well, but that's not really the focus. Again, what we want to do is increase the mine life from nine years to ten plus. And again, because we haven't done any organic exploration, the concept is is that we want to work on building up the area in between the south end of the main pit towards the 22 zone. There's plenty of targets of opportunity in here, and we'll get into those in a minute. Now, because we're contemplating a truck and shovel open pit mining fleet as per the feasibility study, you know, it, it's so much easier to put shallow ounces into the ground. When I say shallow, I mean the near surface, you know, you, you can build up tons very, very quickly, as opposed to underground development, which is very capital intensive, takes a lot of drolls, tight spacing and you know you're going a little bit deeper so it, it's time intensive as well now not to say that that's not on the plan for us but we're going to be getting those into the pipeline of projects which i'm going to talk about here in a second okay so very simple geological this is our model this is the sk rift essentially what it is is it's an extensional basin and these faults that occur from depth are the conduits for the fluid flow so the mineralization, which is you know, essentially in solution, uh, the gold, the silver, the mercury, the antimony, the arsenic, the copper, lead, zinc, they're sitting in solution. And then when they come up to the seafloor, interact with the cold seawater, it precipitates and forms the bonanza grades. Now, the other thing too is that mineralization is very much restricted to the plumbing system. So we have to be near that. And we've, we've learned that over the years. 
And if we take a look at that in plan view, you can see the geometry of, of the deposits themselves. They occur within this rift. And there's plenty of targets, but you know, there's this weird truncation which occurs up to the to the northeast. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, where we uh, where we also had some success in the SKDs. And again, just to remind your audience of, of very simple geology, it's you know a VMS system. So there's cyclicity. So you know we get different periods of quiescence in between volcanic events. These are where we get our mudstones. We get the syn volcanic faults. And again, those syn volcanic faults are critical because that's the plumbing system. But this is where the magic happened originally for Escape Creek. This is the cold seawater up top here, a kilometer down below surface. These are the contact mudstones sitting on top of the rhyolites. And then as the fluids are flowing, they're circulating, regenerating, and they're flooding into areas. And that's where we get the bonanza grades. Now keep in mind, that's what Barrick preferentially mined out. When they were in production, they were taking out the contact mudstone. But what they neglected to go after were some of these feeders, and some of these lower units of mineralization that are sitting down here, because this is you know approximately two gram material, never made the grade for them at the time. Because again, keep in mind the cutoff was like 15 grams a ton. So these were neglected. But these are really nice because these are similar to what we talk about in our 23 zone, our areas in between the 21A and 21A West, all the way down to the 22. So these are the areas that are going to give us more additional tonnage for the uh, basically the increase in the mine plant and the life. So, so are let's those get to feeder it. zones, yeah, Paul, are those feeder zones, have you already explored those? Or are you still exploring, still making discoveries for these zones? Great question. Two things. So yes, we're still exploring them. And as we're exploring them, we're making discoveries as well, which actually I'm going to get into next. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we'll talk about the, the 23 and the 21A West. So again, just for reference, this is the 21A zone sitting here at the southern portion of the uh, main pit. The 21A West zone occurs within that. Okay, it's a new discovery though, and you'll see that in a second. And then the 23 zone, which we'll discuss, is about 200 meters into the section. And I think we're gonna start with that one. So if we go back, to oh geez this is 2020 what we did is we put some drill holes to do infill into the 21a zone you know we needed to increase confidence in that you can see the grades you know 21.9 grams per ton gold 235 grams per ton silver over an extremely respectable width of 35 grams or 35 meters but what we elected to do is have each of those drill holes in that fan pattern continue down and test the other horizons. Again, things that Barrick maybe necessarily didn't worry about at the time. And we did, we had some great success. As an example here, hole 274. It's uh, 12 grams per ton gold, 21 grams per ton silver over six meters. That's great. What it does is it demonstrates that the system is still alive. It's the proof of the concept. Now this one for us was the most interesting. This was hole 290. Six grams a ton gold, 20 grams a ton silver, over 4.2 meters. Again, respectable, it's nice. But then you could argue and say, well, Paul, you know, those other three holes didn't hit. And you're right, that's fine. So what does that mean? Well, we know where the fish are, we know where the fish aren't. So we postulated that this mineralization had to come from some as of yet in 2020 undiscovered plumbing system. These are the syn volcanic faults. So this was just conceptual at the time. Now, if we take that same section and just drift over to the east a little bit, let's take a look at the historical data. These are uh, historical holes that were put into this area. And you can see there's nothing really to write home about. Very narrow widths, very low grade. What this is, is selective sampling. The previous operators were operating with shoestring budgets. They were only putting in the bag what they thought looked good, okay? Now, unfortunately, none of this core exists anymore. And, you know, based on this, the historical data didn't really indicate any potential. However, we were looking at it through a different lens. We had a litany of geological and geochemical reasons why we thought that there was something still there. And 
when we went in and started our first fan of drill holes and also sampling everything top to bottom, you can see what a difference it makes. So as an example right here, this is hole 947, two grams a ton gold, 14 grams a ton silver over 60 meters. Again, that's just sitting literally meters away from a historic drill hole that because of selective sampling, ran virtually nothing. Now, Paul, one thing that I'm noticing within those drill results are it's not carrying that super high grade that we were seeing in that 21A zone, especially closer to surface. What could that potentially mean for the whole mine life aspect? As you mentioned, you're looking at extending mine life. Would this come later in the mine life or would you blend this lower grade material with the higher grade? Uh, great, great questions. Let, let's start with the first one. So the grade. Okay, the contact mudstone sitting up here at the top. Again, that's where the real magic happened at SK Creek. You're not going to see grades like this in the rhyolites and the day sites. Okay, it's just it's a known. Um, there's no exhalative event. It, it's a completely different sort of beast, shall we say? Okay, now. To get this material down here, it's gonna be clean mineralization. So no impurities, no mercury, antimony, or arsenic. You're gonna see lower grades in the two gram per ton realm, which is analogous to what we see in the 22 zone, which is a, another feeder, shall we say. And then with respect to the mine plan, well, let's diverge a bit here. So courtesy of all the work that was done this last year via all the companies, the assay labs are still flooded. We are still waiting on drill holes. That means we're also gonna have some news flow coming up when we get all of that. Once all the drilling is received, we'll give that to our chief resource geologist, Kathy Dilworth, and what she will do is incorporate all of those new results and we will update in the first half of 2023, another resource estimate. What we'll also do is optimize open pits, based on the new mineralization that we discover, which is you know, much bigger than what we just see here in this section, and basically work it out. So ultimately, you know, this will feed into you know, a feasibility update at some point where it's gonna get scheduled in the mine life, not clear 100% yet. We're sort of getting the cart before the horse on this one. Okay, fair enough. The, are these the only three holes that you've even drilled in this area? No, no, this is just a, a simplified section. We've got plenty of other drill holes that uh, basically occur uh, out along strike and as well through the entire area, covering from the 23 zone to the 21A West, all the way down to the 22 zone. So this entire corridor really has been uh, drilled on an exploratory basis at okay. this point. Excellent. Okay, so what we'll do now is talk about the 21A West zone. So again, here's our, our drill section. Here's the 21A zone, which is this, this little blob here, which translates into what we see over here on the right-hand side of the section. Back in 2021, we drilled hole 872. We were targeting something up here off section. You can see how the drill hole comes in. And again, because we sample all of our holes top to bottom, uh, we did get a you know, a mediocre intersection, you know, 1.3 grams per ton over 20 meters. Now that in and of itself is not, in my mind, really that exciting from an economic perspective, because look at all the waste you would have to potentially move to get down to something like this. But we took the lessons learned from our geological understanding out here and said to ourselves, well, okay, that's a sin volcanic fault. It's probably oriented vertically we should probably stick a hole up here. So Adrian, our newly appointed VP of Exploration, drilled the very last drill hole of 2021, hole 997. Way to end on a high note. Close to nine grams a ton gold, 13 grams a ton silver, over 34 meters. Tremendous. So not only was that a great hit, but you can see here that this was historically waste in the resource. So we were planning on, you know, in the engineered feasibility pit, moving all of this stuff and depositing it up subaqueously. We've essentially performed a little bit of geological alchemy and turned waste rock into ore, just simply through organic drilling. So again, the point here is there's opportunities not only outside the pit, you know, which makes sense in the 23 zone, but also even opportunities inside the pit. 
And, you know, we added a few more drills into that area. It turns out it got a little bit wider. What we do see is that the grade increases as we get closer to the contact mudstone. So again, it's keeping in with that two gram per ton range that we were expecting. Now, might you move this pit shell to capture some of this lower on or this deeper down mineralization, or is that potentially underground? You know what? Um, well, that kind of grade is going to work for us underground. Um, you know, in my mind, I'd want to see something in the five grams per ton plus. But what will happen again is referring back to what I was saying about Kathy and doing a resource update, she'll incorporate all of this new data. Um, obviously, we're going to create populated blocks in, in the block model and the resource model. And then once we throw that block model into the open pit software, you know, I, I can't predict the future or have a crystal ball here, but I would anticipate that the pit is going to drop down and try and grab more of this, which means if the pit shape changes here, it might even try and grab more of this down here. But again, we'll have to see where the chips fall after we run all those exercises. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And then just to, to further exasperate this, uh, you know, we go a couple of sections towards the south and uh, we see that there's great continuity along strike. And again, some pretty damn good high grade, like 47 grams a ton gold, 73 silver over 12 meters, you know, analogous over here, 24 meters. Granted, that's an apparent width, but you can see that it's, it's a bit of gravy. We've added mineralization where there previously wasn't any. So stay tuned. There's still assays outstanding. And uh, this, is, this entire area is being populated with more drilling. Now, is the drilling just filling in all that area? What, what can you tell us about the drill holes that are still to come? Great question. A combination of two things, exploratory on, on wide centers. Again, wide centers so that you can find out where this thing is and how big it is. But unfortunately, the, the, I guess the downside of wide centers is that, you know, you probably only get inferred. So then what we did is again, to fast track this into, you know, potential reserves. We also selectively went into certain areas and infilled it on tighter spacings to get it into the measured and indicated categories. So essentially it's, it's a shotgun blast all over the map. Okay, so now what I wanna talk about is um, not only our, our you know, shallow ounces that we've been pushing for, but also the deep stuff. Again, you know, this isn't super high priority. We wanted to test a concept, you know, is there, the potential for additional SK Creek style contact mudstone, super high grade mineralization. And, uh, you know, we got damn lucky on the very first drill hole. So we'll talk about the SK Deeps discovery. We'll get straight to it. You know, this was hole 1081, uh, basically four grams a ton gold, uh, over 32 meters at a depth of 850 meters vertical depth. And this is foot wall hosted mineralization. So remember how we were just talking about the grade. You know, I said the rhyolites, typically about two grams per ton. You know, here we're actually getting slightly better grade posted right underneath the contact mudstone in an area that had been previously drilled. But we'll get into that in a sec. So here we are in cross section. This is the, uh, the uh, section line here over on the map to the left-hand side. Surface up at the top, our, our stratigraphy of rock types. Uh, here's our next zone, which is the northern extension zone, which was historically mined by Barrick. And then you can see all the historical drill holes that were put down in this area. You know, they were looking for the depth extensions of SK Creek. Makes sense. Let's do some linear geology. If my deposit is here, I should probably be going out in the same direction. What you're not seeing on this section is me annotating a bunch of gold and silver hits because they didn't have any. So when they sampled the contact mudstone, for the most part, they didn't get anything. Then what they did is they would either you know, just stop the hole or they'd go a little bit further into the rhyolites and the day sites, but they'd be selective sampling again. Unfortunately, we can't go back to the core because it's all destroyed. Now, anybody in their right mind would say, well, what the hell's the point in going in there? It's been sanitized. Why are you drilling that again? However, because of the selective sampling, we can't assume that they were actually you know, targeting that mineralization and that there's nothing there and it's been written off. And there's the proof in the pudding. Again, the four grams per ton 
over 32 meters sitting in the rhyolite. If we look at a cross section through that same drill hole, again, over here on the map, you can see just how sparsely drilled it is. Some drill holes just didn't make it down far enough. This is, again, a lot of them just weren't even sampled. Now, keep in mind, our contact mudstone, when we did hit it, was only a meter thick and it had nothing in it, which is you know, consistent with what everybody else had drilled historically. But again, here's the proof in the pudding, you know, the four grams a ton over 32. But if we come back to our original geological model, remember when I was saying, you know, there's a plumbing system. There's the plumbing system. So that mineralization had to come out onto the contact mudstone somewhere. And based on what we've learned so far, that should be within about 150 meters of this drill hole. So, wow, what a way to open up a can of worms. First drill hole, it's only two inches wide, got it down and managed to hit mineralization. Really happy with that. So where am I going with all of this? Okay. What kind of irritated me and Adrian and some of my geologists as well is if you've got a world-class deposit, why does it suddenly just truncate? Okay, it just stops in the middle of nowhere. Now, granted, because we have a really good understanding of our SK rift model, you could argue, okay, well, Paul, you know, there you are at the end of your rift at that sort of termination where everything sort of culminates and then it's game over. However, if that was the case and that was the end of SK Creek, there is no way on God's green earth that hole 1081 should have hit anything at all, but yet it did. So what does that mean? Well, we're thinking, and again, this is very conceptual, is that the entire SK rift has been moved. So if we can imagine, perhaps, you know, let's just postulate a, a fault that comes running through here that truncates the deposit. And then if we just take, you know, the footprint of SK Creek, move it over, you know, again, this is a very conceptual idea. It would serve to explain a lot including say, and as an example, those two historical drill holes. One of them never made it down deep far enough. And the other one could have potentially just hit sort of a paleo high where they didn't get any contact mudstone. However, look at that, there's 1081. Our belief is that we just intersected the fringe of something large. Now, what does that mean? We're going back this year, we're probably gonna plug uh, maybe five or six drill holes in that deeper portion of the deposit. You know, if we hit something, we'll know it visually right off the bat. Um, and then what we'll also do is accordingly, we'll just plunk wedges all around. So we'll be able to test some short range variability and basically, well, prove, prove uh, up and see if, if there is actually something down there. Yeah, who knows, right, Paul? But the fact of the matter is, because this is so deep, that would probably come more in at the tail end of the mine life, right? Oh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And if I come back to what I was saying earlier, again, shallow ounces are cheap ounces, right? You know, if you're drilling open pit stuff down to 200 meters, you can whip off those drill holes super fast. It's cheap drilling. You can add the ounces quickly. You know, that intersection was 850 meters down. So we had to drill 850 meters to get down there, which is time intensive. Plus it's also capital intensive. Then we got to go even further. And if you're trying to put down an underground resource, you know, you can't drill that off on 50 meter centers. You got to plug that off on, Jesus, it might kind of even dumb down to like 10 meter centers. So again, capital intensive. What do you do about that then? If it is capital intensive, it doesn't seem like you guys are in any way fast tracking towards development. There's a lot of exploration to do here. So this year is drill, 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 make the feasibility better. Give us a re updated resource. Exactly. Exactly. I think, I think the caveat to add here is that, you know, the whole 1081, that SK deep hole again, you know, didn't hit anything in the contact mudstone, you know, it hit that nice sort of technical success of four grams over 32 meters. The prize down there is the rest of an Escape Creek. 30 grams per ton, excuse me, over say 10, 15, 20, 30 meters. If Skeena was to intersect that, that would be a game changer for Escape Creek. 
So we should be watching for high grade then, hey? You want to see that high grade that you see up closer to surface at SK. That's correct, yeah. We're, we're looking for the stuff that they had mined underground historically. Okay. So fingers crossed for us. When will you be able to start drilling? How long do you think the turnaround times will be at the lab? What more information can you give us on that front? Well, we're hoping to get into that area... I'm going to say maybe start prepping in June and then hopefully getting a rig or two on site in July um, because we have to just, you know, do some ground prep, get everything ready, that type of thing. Turnaround time. Well, obviously, you know, labs aren't just busy right now because they're just cleaning up from summer exploration programs. Basically, how it works is first one into the gates is the one who gets their assays first. So without having to put everything on rush, you know, we'll just see how well the uh, the labs handle everything this summer and, you know, how much activity is, is being flooded into the labs from various exploration companies. Now, it still seems like this SK Deeps area is fairly new in terms of a discovery and exploration. When would you even be able to put some sort of a resource around it? Oh, yeah, that that's going to take a lot of time, again, because... When we go in to do this drilling this year, um, again, say five or six holes, widely spaced, 100 meter centers, because again, we're, we're going out fishing, we're looking for it. Uh, 100 meter centers won't even get you inferred on an underground, right? Mm -hmm. So what you would need to do is populate that even more with infill, maybe getting it down to 50 or 30 meter centers, that might give you inferred, and then indicated and measured would be I would guesstimate 10 meter centers or less. So again, it's one of these situations whereby if, if we hit and we get a couple of hits, um, you know, the, the company's going to be in a luxurious position with a lot of difficult questions. You know, do we sink the ramp further down and put in an exploration drift to uh, drill it from underground? But again, we're doing a little bit of pie in the sky dreaming here right this second right you still have to actually find something there first <laughs> yeah fair enough that's a good way to put it there paul but i guess if we just recap that feasibility study the numbers were already very strong it had a good irr it was free cash flowing for a lot of years there and i know project production dropped off in years six through nine how much more can you improve on those feasibility numbers? Because in all fairness, a lot of the feasibility numbers are driven by some of the earlier on production. Well, that's right. That's right. Well, again, coming back to what I was saying earlier in the discussion, um, you know, the, the mine life is nine years. So again, the exploration's mandate is to increase the mine life and that's through organic growth and, you know, adding more tons and ounces in the shallow near-term environment. Um, the other thing too that we can, you know, I guess a lever that we can pull really is uh, Randy, our new president and CEO, who has a lot of experience in, in open pit mining, essentially, you know, didn't like the concept of us using the 10 meter blocks in, inside the resource model. And when you use a larger block, you tend to dilute and you reduce your grade. Randy is of the belief, and, you know, this is based on experiential work that you know, we can mine this in, in three meter flitches, which means we can be more selective, which means we can reduce the block size. And again, the translation here is, if we reduce the block size from 10 meters down to three, we're gonna get that grade back up again to where it was originally. So that's another lever that we're gonna be pulling here shortly. Again, with that, that resource update that's coming out. Okay, well, Paul, uh, summarize it, I guess, quickly in terms of news flow that we should keep our eyes on. You, you've taken us through everything here, but what's most important in your eyes? What should we be paying attention to? Well, what's gonna happen is when we, uh, we receive our final assays from the labs after we uh, QAQC them and vet them and do all of our internal controls on them, uh, we'll be releasing those. So that'll be the end of all the 2022 drilling. So that's good. Again, those results are going to feed into a resource update. So you're going to see that come out in hopefully the first half of 2023. And then unfortunately, you know, we're just in a bit of a doldrum here. We're uh, going to wait until say June, July, and then we'll come back out and start doing the deep drilling in the SK deeps. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Fingers crossed for Skeena. 
And as well, we're going to follow up and either do some more organic growth drilling in the 21A West, the 23, or potentially uh, getting back to your earlier question about you know, getting things into the reserve category, maybe even doing some infill in that area as well. Okay. Well, Paul, thank you very much for walking us through this. I really do appreciate your slides and kind of that summary of what we've seen and what the big picture plans are to continue to grow and even make that feasibility better at the SK Creek project. If anybody has any follow-up questions for Paul or the team over at Skeena Resources, please email me fleck at kereport.com and I'll get those addressed for you. Paul, I'll touch base with you on the back of some more news. Thank you again for putting together this presentation. Thank you, Corey. Have a great day.